I'd like to welcome everybody to the AVS eTalk on what limits solar cell efficiencies guide for the perplexed to the shockley quiser model. This is being presented by David Cahan. He's a professor at Wiseman Institute of Science and Bar Ilan University. This is a one hour eTalk from one o'clock to two o'clock Eastern time. I thank you for joining us and I'd like to go through a few slides here. When you logged in today, you are automatically muted. Please be sure your volume is up and that your screen view is in full view. This again is a one hour presentation with no scheduled breaks. And upon registering, you were able to submit a question in advance to be answered by David. These questions were reviewed and he will do his best to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the e-talk. If you didn't ask a question in advance, please note we have a Q&A option at the bottom of your screen to type in additional questions you might have along the way. Please feel free to type them in at any time but noting that we will try to get these answered towards the end of the presentation. Um, only the presenter will be able to review and answer the questions in the last 10 to 15 minutes of the e-talk today. Uh, we have a few disclaimers and copyright notices. The presentation is based on sources believed to be reliable, but the AVS and the author presenter disclaim any warranty or liability based on or relating to the contents of this e-talk. Uh, we do not endorse any products, processes, manufacturers, or suppliers, and nothing should be interpreted as such. And the material contained in this e-talk was copied with the permission of the author and instructor of the notes who obtained copyright releases. Since we don't own the copyright of the material in this e-talk, permission to use any part of this material must be obtained from our presenter today, David Cahan. And following today's e-talk, uh, please check out the AVS website to find out more about our society and our membership and what it has to offer. If you are a student, this is also a great time to find out about student membership, chapters, career services, and way to get involved. Angela Klink is our member services administrator and can be reached at her email address here. And finally, remember to complete the online evaluation form following today's e-talk. We appreciate any feedback and we thank you for logging in. And at this time, I'd like to go ahead and introduce uh, David Cahan, professor at the Wiseman Institute of Science and Bar Ilan University on what limits solar cell efficiencies guide for the perplexed to the shockley quiser model. David, if you'd like to share your screen, please. Yeah, let's try. Looks good. Great. So thank you for the introduction. And I thank the AVS for this opportunity to try to preach this uh, explanation of a model that is much misunderstood or abused. Um, part of the talk may be hard, but I have left out most of the nitty gritty, which can be found in the literature, which I gave. And I hope I'll be able to make sure that all of you will be able to understand what it is that is meant by the shock equalizer model and the shock equalizer limit. There are various forms of energy, as we know, and they can be interconverted. And this diagram, which is from some place that I already forgot because I've been using it for years, uh, illustrates it. We have when that is most important for us, the electrical together with the radiant and then their orders. And apart from these interconversions, their orders, like this one between thermal and electrical and thermal and chemical. And then there is PV, which is what we will focus on today. There is a cost for this story, or as it's said, it's said in Latin, dramatis personae. And here are their first names, and I'll give you also their pictures. And this one, as you can guess, is Sadiq Karno. Max is Max Planck. There are two Alberts, one you know very well. The other one you probably don't know, Albert Betts. And he is the person that gave us the theoretical limit for the conversion of wind energy into electrical energy. Then there's Ching Tang. Um, one of the giants in photovoltaics, in my view. And then there are our main actors, William and Hans Joachim, or Bill, Shockley, and Hans Joachim Quaiser. Let's go back to all the various forms of energy and their interconversion. So the efficiencies 
I give you here, for, this is the modern power station to combine cycle from chemical to thermal to mechanical to electrical. In theory, 84%. In practice, the new stations reach 50 to 60%. Not sure if this is with or without scrubbers. The older ones, which are the ones that are most uh, prevalent on the globe, have lower efficiencies, up to 40%. The wind turbines, I already told you about the theoretical limit, can get to 45%. Then in lighting, we know the difference between incandescent lamps, fluorescent lamps, and light emitting diodes, where the latter ones can get up to 50%. Half of the energy, the electrical energy, can be converted into radiant energy. Thermal electrics isn't doing that well, although don't, um, don't underestimate it. It is, in the end, one of the more reliable ways of getting electrical power, like, for example, in spacecraft beyond Mars. Solar roof heaters, of which we have a lot in Israel. In the lab, over 90%. And yes, why? That's because of this gentleman whom I already um, pointed out to you. Let me try to change my pointer. Here it is, yeah. And in practice, the panel on my roof should get 75%, especially if I take care to clean it. And photovoltaics, the single cell, Efficiency, 29%, about 29% is the best we've managed, less than 35% in theory. And there, this immediately begs the question, why? It's not very impressive, to say the least. Before we start to dive into that, we have to make sure that we understand the basics of what is a solar cell. And this comes from Eli Abolovich, now at UC Berkeley. And it has been proposed in various forms, but this one is a very nice one. It essentially tells you, you have an absorber where light is absorbed. And if it's above band gap, above the threshold, you come back to that threshold, then electron hole pairs are generated or electrons are excited and they leave a hole in the valence band. They cannot get out except via two contacts. And those contacts should be selective, one for holes and one for electrons. That sounds very obvious today, but it was because of this gentleman that we realized that that is what is happening in reasonable solar cells, and that's what we need to strive, strive for in optimal solar cells. The main point is that the solar cell, in principle, doesn't require a European junction, as long as you can get this type this combination working. And why aren't solar cells more efficient? That is where in the end we'll get to the shock equalizer model. And the main reason is because photovoltaic conversion is a quantum conversion process. That means it's a threshold process. So we have here one depiction of the solar spectrum. And if we have an absorber, with a threshold for absorption at, let's say, about 1.3 electron volt, then that means that we cannot use for the conversion any photon with less energy. And we can use all of the photons with more energy. The tragedy is that we can only use the threshold energy, even if the photon has twice that energy. That is the idea of this threshold conversion process. So in solar cells, most solar energy is lost. And actually, most of it's lost as heat. So here you have a PN junction, which I use here as an example. And it is illuminated. Some of the photons do not have enough energy in order to excite an electron. So all of their energy is lost, generally by scattering and therefore heating. And then there are photons that have enough, in this case, more than enough energy, and they create an electron hole pair with excess energy, and that excess energy then will thermalize to the bottom of the conduction and top of the valence band, and those are partial losses. This is total loss and partial loss. These are the major losses 
in the solar cell. And with them, you can understand much of what's happening. And the question is, is that all? Before we get to that, let's look at the losses and time scales. So here's an energy diagram, very schematic, valence band, conduction band, and a device is attached so that you, like, you can actually apply or measure the voltage. We have photons that are absorbed and some that are not used, the ones that have too little energy. Those that are absorbed do the excitation, and then we get the symbolization, and then we get the collection. And these, and then there is the process of emission where some of the electrons and holes are not collected and they are, they are emitted, they should be emitted. That way. When we look at these stages, then the losses are first the induced photons, then the symbolization, the energy, and then in the collection, we do it. And they have different time scales. That means that we can measure them also uh, pretty well, pretty accurately. We can now go back to our schematic PN junction and show that when is here because the time scale of the unused photon lost is the same as that of the used photon being absorbed, 10 to seconds. Then we get the symbolization, which is slower, about picoseconds or more. And then we get the collection even slower until we get the electric power out. Why are these time scales so important? And it's because of this. I showed you this schematic of Eli Abramovich of a solar cell. Well, I've created the electrons and the whole, whole the pairs in this box. And here are my contacts that can take them out to do useful work, which is what we want. But a dangerous lurking because they can recombine. So I want them to survive as long as possible so that each of them can find their contact. And that's why the time scale is very important to reduce further losses. So now let's assume that we have figured it all out and we have the losses of the partial, the partial energy loss of the high energy photons and the low energy photons, the induced photons. And then we grind through with this uh, input, the solar spectrum. And we find that the maximum, the optimum for a conversion should be around here. Very good for silicon. It's a lot of flat. But we know that's not true. And indeed, the explanation is there are more losses. The first one is a Carnot loss because we can do at least near equilibrium thermodynamic treatment and then consider the source at 5,800 5, K, which is the sun's surface, and room temperature 300 K, there we are. You plug it in here, is the Carnot factor, and you find that you lose 5% at room temperature. Decrease the temperature or increase the changes. So that's the first loss. And then there is something called étendu loss or photon entropy. And it has to do with the angle at which the solar energy reaches Earth compared to from where it is radiated out of the solar disk. And the energy of the device that absorbs it, the angle at which the device that absorbs it, it radiates out its thermal energy or its emissions, luminescence. And those angles are vastly different. And because they are so different, there's a change in entropy, which can be from STATMAC, statistical mechanics, written as the logarithm of the ratio between the angle at which they are emitted and which they are um, intercepted. So that is 
because we catch only a very small part in terms of, uh, of all the solar radiation. That's our good luck. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. It would be way too hot. Yes. You lose when over this in this natural logarithm, which gives you about 275 milli electron volt, a little bit more. Because of just this term, which is temperature dependent. And it's essentially the T delta S term. So we have another thermodynamic loss. This was tested some decades ago by a scientist in Spectrolab, who are specializing in 3.5. Uh, solar cells. This comes from Richard King when he was there. And what you have here is the solar spectrum on Earth. So these are all the absorptions in the atmosphere. The different materials have a band gap that we can determine from the external quantum efficiency of the device rather than from the absorption which is more accurate, but it's not practical for many types of solar cells. So this is often used as an alternate. And we can measure the open circuit voltage, which is what they did, degrees. And the difference are these, is this red, these red triangles, which are connected here. The red line is what you would expect if all your losses were only these thermodynamic losses. And you see that Gary Marsnite is pretty close, was already then pretty close. So there's one way to decrease data and loss, and that is to concentrate, because then you go into a situation as if you are closer to the sun. This shows you results from uh, quite some time back, where a solar cell is illuminated with more and more concentrated light until at some point the heat dissipation fails and you can't go any farther. Beautiful work of uh, Louise Hurst and Ned Eakins dogs already quite some time back. Uh, they looked at this effect and they said, okay, we can plot um, as a function of the photons that we get from the current that we get from photons, how much we lose by considering again the 1.3, in this case 1.35 threshold energy, that's the photon energy that I have to start with. At maximum concentration, I will not have any energy loss. Yeah. But as I go to lower and lower intensities, then I get more and more of a loss. This is the situation schematically at 300k on uh, Earth because this, this is AM when, when sun. If I go to lower temperatures, I can decrease very much this loss, as you can see here, 450k. So this illustrates how much temperature can help you. So then they made this very nice diagram where you have your threshold, example threshold. This curve shows you. What is the current that you get if every photon that is absorbed gives you an electron? And it goes up slowly because the solar spectrum uh, gives you more and more photons up till here when it would be about 70 milliamps per square centimeter. But that's not very practical, but you can calculate it. So you take this, say I'm at 1.35 electron volts here. I get this current. So the area is the power I can get. However, there's the photon entropy loss and thermodynamic loss. The kind of factor with thermodynamic loss. And then there is emission current, which is also a loss. Some of the current is emitted. Some of the uh, electron hole pairs will not give you current, but they will radiatively recombine and emit light. And that is a loss if what you're interested in is electrical power. And why is that? You'll come back to it later. There's a solar cell does behave in many ways like a rectifier. And therefore you can describe it with a diode-like equation. And you will have to give some 
in order to get not only very high voltage, but also high current. And that what you have to give is that you get less voltage. You will have to, have to give some in order to get not just the maximum current, but also some voltage. And what you give there is a loss in current, and that is what is needed. So this diagram shows nicely what you lose and what would give be your ideal current voltage curve. So we have succeeded in bookkeeping. The bookkeeping is not really understanding. There might be some understanding in it. I am not putting down the accountants, but still. For example, what are those emission losses? And I've given you a handwritten argument. And Shockley and Kweiser came not only for that, but also for that, up with a much more rigorous model. So this is from their original uh, paper. I use it as an illustration, but the paper itself is not easy to read. I'm trying to, I will try to follow the title of the lecture and you'll see in a minute why. So we have absorption of sunlight and sun radiated emission. And now you're going to do beam counting because you say this is the rate at which photons are absorbed. So this is the rate at which electrons are flowing. The difference between them must be the rate of radiated recombination. I must be able to count these photons and these electrons and get this number of photons. Conservation of particles. That was their idea. And they published it in the 1961 paper in Journal of Applied Physics, which has been included in a list of papers that are called sleep, Sleeping Beauties. Sleeping Beauty is a paper that lies dormant for a few decades. In this case, mainly it was about two decades when Art Nozick and others revived interest in it. In other words, it was cited very poorly. And then it became the central paper. You can use the Shockley Kreiser model to calculate what is the maximum possible efficiency depending on the threshold energy, which has been given here as the photovoltaic gap, which is something that you can derive from spectral, from the spectrum of the cell rather than the absorber for the same reason as I gave before that generally cells are made and the absorber itself has not been measured optically. So it's an approximation. And the idea of a PV gap uh, is to, to over out. So this is what our maximum is. The work was by the way preceded by that of Maud Prince and Joe Fersky until they came around. And there was this gentleman who was there before them, Lou Dyson, Dyson. He was a biophysics professor in Leiden in the Netherlands. And as many around that time, was very interested in the optimal, the maximum efficiency of photosynthesis. And there is a great similarity between photosynthesis and photovoltaics. So he got the idea right. He described it in this proceedings paper, but not the rigorous math. These are more or less the best efficiencies of larger one centimeter square or larger cells that have been reported. And you see gallium arsenide is closest to the short requires a limit. And silicon is farther away. It's not entirely fair because I'll mention it without going into too much detail. Silicon has another problem not included <clears throat> in the short requires a model, which is an OG uh, recommendation loss. The, these cells are trying very hard to run with the big boys, where the one that is succeeding at the moment is OPV. OPV has, since uh, the last few years, especially for very small cells, managed to get itself close to this group. And the perovskites, the halide perovskites, but the ones that are commercial are silicon, CIGS, and cadmium telluride cell -like. Gallium arsenide is not so easy to get commercial, at least I haven't been able to. So these are the runner-ups and these are the champions. There's an interesting psychological effect, I think, that many of these cells are around these two values. 
And it's not so clear why, because the optimum is flat. Well, it has, I think, a psychological reason, because this is on the same scale, the original pay, um, the original figure from the Chocolate and Quizer paper from 1961, when they didn't have very accurate solar spectrum. And the maximum is at 1.4, 1.45. And that explains this one. This, I'm not sure, maybe because we want to mimic silicon. So we set out to write this paper. Let me explain to you the, um, the way that the roles are divided. I was pushing for it for quite some time, in part because I found the original paper very difficult to read, and I'm not the only one. And I knew that both Jean-Francois Guillemot and Uwe Rao are great experts. So finally, in 2018, I got them together at the meeting in the Weizmann and convinced them. Um, I think luck also played a role. So we started out and quickly it became clear that it was difficult for me to understand. In comes Thomas Kirschart, a professor in Jülich and a former student of Uwe. And actually what these two very smart people did, this very smart person then translated into a language that finally David Klein could understand. Guide for the Perplexed is the name of a rather famous book by a medieval philosopher, Maimonides. And Maimonides wrote it in order to explain certain theological issues in a way that the common people could understand it. And it was something where he was, he had a nice goal, but he was aware and wrote about it that probably the experts will not be happy. And lo and behold, Within a year, one of the great experts, undoubtedly, Tom Marquardt, was not happy and wrote a comment on our comment, to which we replied and defended ourselves that whatever we wrote was correct. But yes, there are different ways to look at the uh, efficiency of solar cells. And I'll give you some. So some of my, Tom's uh, comments are definitely taken into account in this lecture. So we have the shock and Kaiser model. Here's a nice picture of what it is trying to tell you. But that model has assumptions, like any model. And it assumes that absorption is a step function, that every electron gives only one electron hole pair and no more and no less. That the system is in thermal equilibrium, which brings thermodynamics in that any recombination of electron hole pairs will be radiated and not via heat. And that you have contacts that are perfectly selective, so you will not lose at the contacts. Now, there are various ways in which you can dev uh, deviate from these assumptions and you lose. Here are some, because a step function is not what a real material will do when absorbing light. And there are a few more here. We can get less than one electron hole pair for these reasons. reasons. We may not have managed to stay into equilibrium, especially thermodynamic equilibrium. I just told, talked to you about two thermodynamic factors. And then a recombination, OJ recombination I mentioned, especially for silicon. If you have defects, you can get recombination, which becomes non-radiative. And also surface and interfaces are good places for recombination that will not be radiated. And if you are not selective enough, then you get losses at the contact. And also some of the electrons may be lost in the whole contact and vice versa. And this will show up. So there are various ways in which we can behave. So I showed you this before. I'll show you now the simple picture. And here I show you another way to look at it, a little bit simpler, the not absorbed and thermalized, recombination, which we want to be radiative. And all of these are, have to do with thermodynamics. That is 
rather than separate the kernel from the thunder, you can lump them together because they are both some, uh, temperature dependent. That's another way to look at things. Or another way to represent it is to look at the fraction of power that you lose from having ideal uh, conversion. Not absorbed, thermalized, all these thermal or thermodynamic losses and the recombination. It's a very valid way to look at the losses in the solar system, like this one and the previous one. Furthermore, we can look at the shock equalizer model. We'll go into that. We can look at the time scales. We'll look at a band diagram if you have a PN junction. Or we can take an electrical engineering, engineer's look, view. All of these are representations of solar cells where we can point to, well, here is a loss, 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 here is a loss. Shock equalizer model is one model with clear assumptions, and it has been very useful to set limits. It has also spurred on people to try to find ways around it, and we'll talk about that. So now let's start with some of the assumptions. Step function. Okay, room temperature optical absorption of some solar cell materials. Gallium arsenide is by far the closest to the set function, but it's not the step function. Silicon is quite a ways away. The organics are quite a ways away. And uh, halide perovskites already in 2014 weren't doing so bad. They are very, they are even sharper than gallium arsenide at the edge, at very low absorption. It's gallium arsenide is thicker. The one electron hole pair assumption. So we take the same curve that we saw before. You assume one electron per photon. That's the maximum you can get. And you see that silicon is doing quite well. This is an experimental result for crystalline silicon at short circuit. That's here. Now you don't get any power in it because your voltage is zero. This is where you get the best. The maximum power. So that's the red uh, square. Those are the red squares. You see, by the way, cathode sunlight is pretty close. There's several, uh, two of these, it doesn't matter. And some are poor. They had perovskites came very quickly close to the curve, to the theoretical curve, but they still have some ways to go with the loss and maximum power. The band gap versus the open circuit voltage that is measured can be understood from the thermal losses. Or, and this one, this term we talked about, and this term we talked about, there's one other term that gives you a gain due to carrier cooling, but it's so small, we will not go into that. What you see from the appearance of the temperature of the observer is that the lower the temperature, the higher the open circuit voltage. And at absolute zero, there will be no difference between VOC and the uh, band gap, if all other effects of being okay. So we can argue that solar cells like really the cold. That should be good in space, except that when you are facing the sun and you don't have uh, ways to get rid of the heat, it's not so good. Radiative recombination. To understand that, let's consider at which voltage that the solar cell can give is the luminescence maximal. And it's the open circuit voltage. Because at the open circuit voltage, I get zero, no current. So I have all these electron hole pairs and they'll recombine. So I want them to recombine radiatively. This is my best chance. So I can look at the electroluminescence as, uh, and calculate when the, uh, the electroluminescence as a function of the photovoltaic gap, and then look at the open circuit voltages that have been measured, and the ones that would be ideal. So this is if I have 100% efficiency for that uh, electroluminescence. This is for 10%, this is for 0.1%, and so down. You see, gallium arsenide is more than 
efficient as a solar cell in terms of electroluminescence. The next one is gallium phosphide and the uh, halide chloroscopes. And then comes the rest. So all of these orders lose a lot in terms of non radiative recombination. And that is what gives gallium arsenide and ABX3, the halide perovskites, and gallium phosphide very good voltage efficiency. The others are not that bad because the, the losses are not that dramatic, but they are there. And we'll see that later. Now, all this story about the luminescence can be checked by looking at the relation between external quantum efficiency for electroluminescence and the power conversion efficiency for photovoltaics. And you see there is a relation. And if the cells are, and these are old OPV cells, I do not have data for the new OPV cells. Uh, if they are poor in terms of power conversion efficiency, if they are poor in terms of electro, uh, in terms of electroluminescence. Amorphous, uh, amorphous silicon is here. Crystalline silicon is quite remarkable as an indirect band cap material. Everything else has been fine tuned and it's not doing so bad. And the perovskites now are a little bit higher. They think they have surpassed crystalline silicon because this is from 2018. But there is a saying that should not be abused that the good photon to electron converter must also be an efficient LED. But it has also been said if the material is a uh, good uh, luminescer, it will be a good photovoltaic material. And that doesn't have to be true because you can have an excellent luminescence from, let's say, the rare earth, but you won't be able to make a solar cell out. But if you have already a reasonably performing solar cell, then one way to try to improve it is by working on the luminescence. So, so much for the open circuit voltage because it's re really not what matters most for us. We want to get power out in photovoltaics. And therefore, we're really interested in the maximum power voltage and the maximum power current. If we look at the total power compared to what the photon, uh, the total energy compared to what the photon energy was that is put in, the threshold energy, and see what we lose. This is the curve that you saw before that can be calculated from the losses losses that we know occur. And here you see that gallium arsenide and gallium and phosphate are very close to that theoretical limit at maximum power. There's some that get very far off, like photosynthesis, amorphous silicon, organic or organic PV. At least in 2019, that was the case. And then there are the head cross which have been doing not badly. And nowadays, these have improved a lot, and these have improved quite a bit also. But we have to be fair. If you have a material that is statically disordered, like amorphous silicon, already in the early 80s, teacher showed that you will have an extra loss of about 300 millivolt, millivolt in voltage because of the scattering and the difficulty to get the quasi thermal level splitting, something I will not go into now. So amorphous silicon is not great, but it's not as bad as it looks. And photosynthesis is a good example of where efficiency was not really the most important thing. Nature really wants sturdy, sturdy and reliability and reliable. So the maximum power point is represented also by the fill factor, you know, which is what theoretically could be the power and what really is the power, these two areas. And when we have a PN junction, that is the easiest way to explain it, the PN junction has to be a diode as rectified. Now it can be an ideal diode, a less ideal or a lousy diode. The black curve for the ideal diode is where crystalline silicon really rules. Gallium arsenide is getting close. This is the uh, multi silicon. These are the single crystals. And the others are not doing so well with the halide proskites and the OPV. And if you look back a decade, cadmium tellurite have improved quite a bit. So you want here to get as close as possible to an ideal diode. And this has a lot to do 
is the selectivity of your contacts. Where otherwise you will lose, or in an electrical engineer in terms of shunt. We can now summarize looking at the assumptions that we already talked about and the stages in terms of time scales of energy losses. Optically, loss of photons that are observed, thermal, that's the thermalization, excess kinetic energy, and also the cell temperature, and electronic, which can be lost by photo emission or during carrier collection. If you violate these assumptions, you will get losses that will lower the current and also the voltages and the fill factors. So you can now, and that's what we did, define figures of merit in how that tell you how well the assumption is met. So you would like it to be as close as possible to well. I will not go into details because the lecture is not really the place to go into the nitty gritty, but I can later show it uh, graphically. So first I show you by illustration of what is meant by the um, step function assumption. This is what I would like. And this is what I don't like. Because now I will not be absorbing only at the bank. When electron hole pair, I do not want to lose my uh, the photon energy in getting uh, away from the when electron hole pair cre creation, for example, via states that are in the gap. This is relatively easy. I would like to be as close as possible to thermal equilibrium so that I can do, use near equilibrium thermodynamics. The combination, I would like it to be radiant with all these little lattice springs not being activated. And this I would not want, which is something that is encouraged by having defect levels in the gap. And then there's selectivity, which says that I really want none of the red ones to go here and none of the blue ones to go here, and this difference to be as small as possible. It was this very large, large difference here that also was a problem for OPV for a long time. And this is what I do, do not want, where it's essentially free for all for the carriers, which contact they take. So back to the figures of merit, where this is the best. And this is, as we go down, it gets worse and worse. So gallium arsenide is doing well, but in terms of its short circuit current, it can improve. Silicon is doing better in terms of short circuit current, but poorer in terms of voltage. Understandable also because of its indirect band gap. And we look at uh, copper and gallium cellulite versus cadmium telluride, you see that cadmium telluride has still a voltage problem. While copper and gallium cellulite has more of a current problem. In the halide perovskites, they're in between, but they're really poor in terms of the fill factor. And that means the contents are far from ideal. And these are the quantum dot cells and these are the OPV cells where this loss, the green loss, has decreased in the last few years, but not yet for certified one centimeter square cells as far as I know. But the feasibility has been shown. So apart from that, I can lose by violating the assumptions of the Shockley-Quizer limit. I also can gain by going beyond the Shockley-Quizer assumptions. And that is what is called, it is a terrible term to break the Sokli Quizer limit. No, you just do not follow the assumptions. And therefore, the model is not the model to use. So, the first one is I can use multi junctions more than when solar cell. I can use up conversion, optical up conversion, or in theory, I could use an intermediate gap solar cell. This is not practical. Yet. And we do not know if that would be practical. These two, yes, they were. And this one has definitely shown uh, efficiencies well above 35%. Then the one electron hole pair that can be impact ionization when I get more than one electron hole pair, single efficient does the same word, down conversion. And here I can go to hot carrier cells, a very popular idea where I try to prevent the symbolization of the photon energy 
and I then have to modify my emission model, and I have the challenge to find selective context for these cells, which is not so simple. So towards the end, we have seen this form of showing where I lose in terms of power conversion in a photovoltaic cell. I can now look at power density and I get a similar picture where this is the output voltage. Well, well here it was the band gap. So if the power out radiative and affine, uh, you can reach this. Now I can put here the copper in gallium sunlight cell and see how far it deviates from the ideal shock equalizer um, efficiency. I go to what I showed you before, which is the figures of merit, and I can see, yes, where CIGS loses, and it's mostly in the voltage, less so in the current, and somewhat in the flow factor. I can also look at the IV curve and I'll say that at the maximum power point, I'm losing here if I am violating the first two assumptions. I'm losing here if I'm violating the third one. And this is what gives me when I go now away from the less voltage to a lower voltage when I get recombination, non radiative recombination, and selectivity gives me a lousy fuel factor. So I hope that by now you are all a bit less perplexed about the model. And many thanks, especially to Thomas Kirschhardt and Fabitra Nayak. And naturally to these two gentlemen who decided that when the Journal of Applied Physics rejected their paper, they should try again. That was after Shockley got over his pure, pure attempt. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, David. I appreciate you giving this presentation today and I open it up to any questions. If you have them, please type them into the Q&A. David, if you wanna take a look, there is a question in the Q&A right now. If you wanna go ahead and read that and provide an answer and that'll give others time to type in some additional questions if they have them. So the question is, how does Ethan Delos compare for full sun and cloudy weather where the light hitting the cell changes from one direction to many directions? You lose so much on cloudy weather that the Itandula loss becomes less important than what you lose because you don't have any more direct uh, sunlight uh, exposure. Naturally, the light that is dispersed uh, will suffer less from Itandula's loss, but it is so much less in terms of energy that that gain is not really significant. All right, thank you very much. If anybody else has additional questions, please feel free to type them in. I'm gonna go ahead and share some closing slides just to give everybody a moment or two to type those in or any comments in there, that would be great. And I'll take the screen from you temporarily, David, and review some material while they type in anything, okay? So. All right, so you have participated in today's AVS eTalk on what limits solar cell efficiencies guide for the perplexed to the Shockley Quiser model. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate that. And to go over a few things coming up, we have an AVS short course schedule. We have just this week in two days, we have the AVS Mid Atlantic chapter hosting a course on semiconductor device manufacturing overview with Bridget Rogers. This is a full day, single day course. Registration is open and still available, so please check it out if you're interested. You can sign up today. Uh, coming in December, our New Mexico chapter is also having an online short course on evaporative thin film deposition, uh, also a full day course. Uh, a little bit longer than the one in at the Mid-Atlantic chapter, but they are doing that in uh, New, Mexican, New Mexico's time zone. Uh, Zoom platform registration is open. We have another eTalk coming up in December. Linking dry corrosion and catalysis can surface chemistry influence corrosion pathways uh, with Petra Renke. That is a one hour e-talk similar to today. So check it out, sign up online if you're interested. And following those, we have three upcoming webinars. These are half day events. Uh, there is a fee to these, but they are on good topics. If you're interested, we have area selective deposition. 
in December, Fundamental and Practical Insights on Stress Evolution During Thin Film Growth in January, and Atomic Layer Deposition from an Applications Perspective in February. All these are open for registration now, so you can go to the webinar schedule and sign up. And finally, we also have some upcoming technical meetings. You'll see we have March, April, May, and June uh, booked for the Frontiers of Characterization and Metrology for Nanoelectronics in Monterey, the Area Selective Deposition Workshop in San Francisco in April, the International Conference on Metallurgical Coatings and Thin Films in San Diego, and the Atomic Layer Deposition uh, with the Atomic Layer Etching Workshop in June in Ghent, Belgium. Uh, we're going back to in-person events. Uh, check these out on our AVS events calendar. Don't forget, if you're not a member yet, you can still sign up any day because it's good for 365 days. Benefits include publication access to publications, professional career development, technical resources, gives you discounts on registration for symposium and select meetings and exhibits, short courses and webinars, and more. So check that out as well. Uh, following this e-talk, you can go to the AVS website and find out more about our society and membership. And if you're a student, it's a great time to find out about student membership, chapters, career services, and ways to get involved. We are located internationally and nationally. So check out AVS and see if you'd like to become a member. And you can check with Angela Klink on any more details. And uh, David, thank you for doing this e-talk. Uh, e and we hope everybody had a great time and we ask that you complete the online evaluation form. It does look like we have a couple more questions in the Q&A um, if you wanna check those and we have a few more minutes to go through these. Uh, okay. Uh, what method has shown most effective in going beyond the quasi limit? And that's multi-junctions. Multi-junctions are now uh, without uh, Concentration at above 35%, 36, 37. And uh, the other one followed is concentration. If you concentrate light, then you can also go, but I'm not aware of a single cell having done above 35%. And then there is another one. If a nanomaterial is a good absorber, but not a good emitter, is it worth being exploited as an active layer in a solar cell? I first try to make sure that uh, you can get the emission up and in the nanomaterial, that's generally a matter of surface preservation. For example, in the head of the the uh, nanoparticles have, uh, after treatment, surface treatment, shown uh, very high emission efficiencies, so high that it's within the error from 100%. If the material is intrinsically not a good emitter, then no, then it will be very difficult to use it as a service. All right, thank you so much. I do not see any additional questions at this time. If anybody has them, we have a couple more minutes to go. Again, I wanna thank everybody for joining us today. I know most of you are in various time zones, including David himself, who's in the evening hours. So thank you again, David, for jumping in here with that. And I think there are no further questions. We are free to go. And thank you to everyone. And hopefully you'll join us at an upcoming AVS eTalk webinar or short course or perhaps a technical meeting in 2022. So thank you again, everyone. And thank you, David. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.